Okay, hi. Uh, welcome to my first ever YouTuber set. Um, I have the state-mandated Amiibo collection. I got the stack of books to seem smart. Um, yeah, so anyway, I thought it would be nice to, you know, do a little um, kind of video about my masters, kind of summarize that, talk about what my area of expertise is, maybe try and, you know, demystify it a bit, because I feel like um, grad school is built up to be a little bit of a very intimidating black box, which in a lot of ways it really isn't, um, and I don't think it should be, so I think, you know, sharing a little bit of that information would be useful for people. Like, by and large, I think the biggest barrier to grad school is, like, by far the financial one, because, like, you could be, like, extremely smart, but if you don't have, like, the right set of scholarships and grants that, you know, can help fund your very, like, either no pay or low pay masters, then like that's going to be the main thing that's keeping you out of grad school. Because I've met a lot of uh, smart people, but I've also met a lot of, uh, let's say, buffoons in grad school. So just a little background for those who don't know, um, in undergrad I studied engineering physics, which is a little bit of like a weird niche one where it's kind of like doing electrical engineering, but with a minor in physics, like 50% electrical, 50% physics, um, and then that's kind of like gearing you up for the solid state physics kind of area where it's instead of designing like a large scale circuit and connecting a bunch of components together, I'm more so de designing the like individual components like transistors, diodes, like resistors, that sort of thing. And then my master's itself was a master's of applied science in electrical engineering um, technically electrical and computer engineering, but I, I would really say it's more like the electrical half. So at my school, they make the distinction between a master's of engineering and then a master's of applied science. Um, depending on like what school you go to, they might interchange those two terms. Um, at least at my school, they differentiate between the course-based masters, which is the MEng, and then the uh, thesis-based masters, which is the masters of applied science. And like, uh, the criteria for those two is you either do 10 courses, just 10 like regular lecture courses, that's the MEng, or you do five courses and then a thesis, and that's the uh, MASC, and that's what I did. There's a little bit of like a weird snobbery or like kind of hierarchy around the course based versus thesis based. I know that like some professors have kind of talked down on the course based students in the classes, which I don't think is necessarily <laughs> entirely fair. Um, I think the general rule of thumb, at least in the industry, is like, uh, if you're choosing to do a master's, go do a thesis one, but if your employer is paying you to do a master's, then you go back and do a course-based one, and then that's generally the safest option. And technically, I can't call myself an engineer yet, because um, unlike the US, in Canada, each of the provinces um, like regulates a, a governing body of engineers so to actually call myself an engineer I need to like get my degree which I have um, I need to pass an ethics test uh, and the part I don't have yet is I need four years of work experience and I'm only at two right now so technically I can I can say that I do uh, engineering work or that I'm an engineering training but I, I can't legally call myself an engineer otherwise there's like you know, like a whole bunch of fines associated with that. So the specific type of engineering that I did um, is photonics, which you can see in my perfectly placed textbook. Um, I would say photonics is a subset of electrical engineering. If we're like dividing it up into like subfields, we've got like microprocessors, you've got radio and uh, microwave frequency electronics. You have like nanoscale solid state electronics power and energy electronics, but yeah, photonics is anything to do with the like transmission and absorption of light at like the micro scale. Like you're probably familiar with optics as a term from like high school maybe. Um, optics is kind of what I think of when you think of like Isaac Newton in the 1600s. You got mirrors and prisms that makes like that rainbow light and all those lenses and telescopes and stuff like that. And then like that's differentiated from photonics, which didn't really exist until the 1950s when they came up with like molecules and atoms and they realized that like 
individual packets of light called photons is what's kind of making everything work. So uh, photonics is a much newer field that deals with like micro scale and nano scale systems. And then within photonics, I kind of narrowed in on a very like particular type of photonics called silicon photonics. That's where you take uh, like the same types of silicon chips that you make computer electronics out of and then all you're doing is pumping light through like different geometric structures and like bouncing off walls you know like splitting power this way this way trying to make an amplifier stuff like that um, and the reason silicon photonics is kind of like coming up recently is that a big advantage of it over stuff like other more exotic materials like lithium niobate is that it's very cheap because we have all these existing foundries over in like the US and East Asia. So we're piggybacking off of that like existing infrastructure, saving a lot of money. And it kind of took until like the early 2000s for it to get to a level of like cost benefit where it was cheap enough to like really pay off. Like they really wanted to get silicon photonics working for like the 80s and 90s, but the like the economic side wasn't there. So now it's really kind of blown up in the 2010s. So for the particular masters that I did, um, I had to take exactly five courses, which uh, doesn't sound like a lot, and it really it really isn't a lot because uh, compared to my bachelor's where I was taking uh, like 10 courses a year, that's like five in the first semester, five in the second semester, um, it, it really is not that much, but grad courses are like, they're harder for other reasons that make them almost equally as stressful because you're not just like taking courses, you're teaching courses, you're trying to like do research on the side to pick what your thesis is going to be. So there's like a bunch of other factors that fill in the gaps of where you used to be like taking courses. Uh, and like the big difference I would say between undergrad and grad courses is that undergrad courses you have like two or three deadlines per class per week. Like you've got assignments, you've got a midterm, you've got a lab. Um, and you've got five courses all at once, whereas grad school, you might have for like the entire course, two assignments, a midterm, and then a final, and like maybe a presentation and like that's it. So all of your marks are spread out over a very small number of things. So it's very stressful where you're thinking like, if I just, if I completely bomb this one thing, that's 30% of my grade, just gone. So in general, you do have the freedom to take those five courses um, as long as it's before you defend your thesis, you can take them the first semester, your last semester, whatever. Uh, my particular supervisor, she generally prefers that you get your courses done like right at the start, um, which I, I kind of found nice because it meant I could just like concentrate on the marks, get them done, and then like entirely focus on my thesis later. So my course load ended up being uh, three courses in my first semester and then two courses in my second semester. So first semester, I took three courses. Uh, the first one was silicon photonics. That one was taught by like my specific supervisor because that's her area of expertise. Uh, that was a really great course. Um, really zoomed in on like the like theoretical equations while also like looking at a very specific type of material. So you got a lot of like real world numbers. The one thing I really liked about that course was we had a like semester long research project where each group was given a type of like geometry and then we needed to make a like specific circuit. So we needed to make like a 50-50 power splitter. So like light comes in, 50% comes out one and 50% comes out the other. And then it also had to be uh, polarization independent, which means that like the magnetic field and the electric field both need to work equally. And I don't know how hard that sounds to you, but it was a lot, a lot more difficult than I thought it was going to be. And when when I was talking about uh, buffoons in grad school, um, for this particular project, uh, we had like three months to get this done, and one of my group members, th like the night before it's due, is starting his simulation work and like asking me questions. Um, and what he doesn't realize is that. Uh, these simulations take literal hours in a best case scenario and multiple days in a worst case. So he, he's not only 
like starting tonight, he's teaching himself the, the software tools. So we're all on Skype and I'm waiting for him up at 2 a.m. to submit his PowerPoint slides, uh, which is when I get the message that he's dropping the course. Uh, and just to give you a little bit of context, uh, grad, grad courses typically have very low like enrollment figures, like it's 25 people max. So he basically took up a spot in a very popular course and then dropped it on the last day he could because he didn't realize he couldn't get it done in one night. The second course was Fiber Waveguide Components, which was uh, a, kind of like a lighter class on um, exactly like different types of photonics technologies. So we have optical fibers, we have waveguides, which are just like basically boxes that you pump light through. Um, introduction to like switches, uh, networks, amplifiers, stuff like that. Um, it was a little more of like a seminar based class where the prof would uh, talk for two hours and then the final hour, uh, like three students each week would present like a paper that they were given to research and they would have to like communicate the findings, talk about like the results, like where could they take the research further. So th that, that was good to get you like reading papers early on because you want to kind of build up that mental memory of research you found interesting so you can maybe like cite it later on or like get ideas from it. Uh, that course was 6 to 9 p.m. on a Friday and then the final course that semester wasn't a like regular course uh, it was called directed studies which is when you, you go to like the graduate supervisor in the department and then you basically propose um, a self-guided lesson plan for the semester and they just approve it. Uh, so the proposal that like I went with was uh, University of British Columbia has this online course in photonics that's like three weeks and then you actually get to like submit a circuit at the end of it um, and then they'll actually fabricate it for you and test it, send you the results back. Um, so I basically proposed I would do that and then uh, my supervisor got me signed up for like another uh, thing like that where you go to um, a week-long conference in Quebec City um, with a bunch of other Canadian University grad students and then you listen to a bunch of lectures and then again you get to actually submit a circuit to get uh, fabricated. Yeah, so luckily they approved that lesson plan for the semester um, and the way they mark it is you basically you need to choose a prof in the department who's not who's not already your supervisor and then they they mark you on literally just two things. It's a report of what you did, that's 50%, and then a presentation that's 50%. Um, and so, so I think you understand what I mean when there's like very few deliverables for a lot of grad courses. Um, and actually the Quebec City thing was really lucky because uh, it just so happened that one of my friends that I went to undergrad with, uh, he was also going to like um, a different Canadian university who got to go to this like Quebec City conference. Uh, so we got to hang out in Quebec City for a week, so that was uh, uh, very cool. Also, this is a life pro tip that maybe only applies to electrical engineering, but if you want really cheap textbooks, don't buy the uh, North American edition. What you should do is buy the uh, special Indian edition, which means um, it is only for sale in India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Bhutan. Uh, because it is literally the exact same book, fully in English, page numbers mostly the same, uh, it's just 80% cheaper. So I have um, about five uh, illegally sold textbooks from uh, India, so if you want to save some money. So the next semester I just had two courses to take. The theory of semiconductor devices was honestly a little bit of a kind of a repeat for me because we I, I kind of went in depth in that stuff during my bachelor's, so I had a little bit of a leg up in that class compared to um, a lot of the grad students who seemed like they were coming from like the computer engineering coding side of things. So I definitely think they had a much rougher time than I did. So that was that was a nice easy uh, mark course. The other course I took, advanced topics in electromagnetism. That's actually a rotating course. It depends on what prof is teaching it each, each semester. They have like their own little specialty. 
in the semester I took it, it was mainly um, like kind of like the math of waveguides. A waveguide is exactly what it sounds like. Imagine a structure where you input a wave of light and it's meant to just guide the wave along it. So like an example of a waveguide is a fiber optic cable. That's just a tube, right? So like you shoot light in and it's gonna follow the tube along its entire path. Uh, there's lots of different types of waveguides. Some are square, some are like a weird kind of multi-level square thing, but you solve Maxwell's equations for all of these different geometries. You go very in depth on like the different types of cylindrical, rectangular, you do like uh, a structure where like the refractive index kind of curves upwards exponentially. Like you do a lot of crazy math stuff like that. And I know a lot of people were like, kind of scared of this course because of that math angle, but um, it ended up being not that bad. And I think one of my like favorite courses that I took. Uh, so here is where the part you might have been expecting comes into play. Uh, I graduated during a pandemic, uh, surprise. I started my master's in fall of 2019, which meant that in my second semester, uh, around February, uh, you know, some of the universities were like, hey, maybe you should stay at home. And then in uh, March of my second semester, that's when Canada was like, all right, no more airplanes, everybody go home, uh, and everything shut down. So. Uh, yeah, I had to complete like three quarters of my master's in my little basement apartment. So in the immediate aftermath in that second semester, I, I was taking two courses. Uh, I was a teaching assistant and I was just kind of like doing a little bit of like intro research for my thesis. Um, the two courses actually ended up like fine. Uh, both of them kind of migrated to uh, online pretty effectively. Actually, we, we got our final canceled for one class because the prof didn't know how to like proctor an online exam. So he just, his proposal was, okay, uh, each of you are going to individually Skype call me and then I'm going to quiz you on questions that I come up with on the spot. Uh, but also this was opt-in. So everyone was just like, I'm not gonna opt in for that. And then he sent an email like a week later and he was just really mad that no one opted in. So he's just like, all right, there's no final. Your marks are just what the midterm was. And I was ahead of the curve in that class. So that boosted my mark up and uh, worked out very well for me. So after that semester, um, I was completely finished up my courses. And because a master's is about like two years uh, in general, um, I had about like a year and a half to come up with an idea start simulating it, maybe start trying testing it, and then I actually have to write my thesis and get ready to defend it. And of course, you know, because the world shut down, uh, we were not allowed to go to campus anymore, which meant uh, I now had to think of a thesis idea that didn't rely on like going into the lab and using the test equipment or anything there. So this is where I got uh, extremely lucky. A lot of like electrical engineering, um, like even in like non-pandemic times is done through simulators. So like very robust software programs with a lot of like math under the hood where you design like 3D models of your circuits and you like input like a laser source and then it basically divides up your thing into like a bunch of grids and then like it calculates the field here, calculates it in all the adjacent quadrants and then it like, it, like back calculates and does like Maxwell's equations and then you actually get like like these days these simulation softwares are like extremely accurate and you can do like really robust predictions of what these things would actually be like it's not uncommon for people even in non-pandemic years to do simulation only theses like their entire work is just simulation work it does have to be like very robust simulation work, but like people can get entire degrees just based on simulations. It would be really nice to get like a functioning fabricated electronic circuit, but even in the best of times that can take like months, it can take years depending on like what you're building. So I basically had to plan my masters around the fact that I probably wouldn't be able to get a functioning circuit and I would have to make a thesis that was almost entirely dependent on simulation work. 
So by this point, it was summer 2020, and basically what I was doing every day was I would wake up, I would sit at my computer, and I would read just papers all day. Like I would go to journals, I would Google keywords that I was interested in, and just find as many papers, read everything I could, and then I was basically just trying to find like a little niche, like a problem that hasn't been solved, and then I would just kind of like combine a, a bunch of different ideas to see if I could like solve that problem. Also, incidentally, uh, because I had a lot of free time around now, uh, this was when I was making the Hendrik Schoen series. Another semester goes by and it's like fall 2020. By this point, I've like gone through a bunch of ideas. Uh, there was a while where I was considering working on uh, LiDAR, which is the sensor that you generally find on stuff like self-driving cars. Normally it's called a radar because it uses radio waves, but if it uses light waves, it's called LiDAR. So, a little fun fact. But eventually, the ideas that I settled on were basically like two separate projects. Um, one, if you've seen my uh, like one minute thesis video, that's the one featured in that. What I wanted to do was I wanted to steer light around really tight corners. The analogy that I like to use for that is Imagine a race car, like at NASCAR or something. When they want to take really tight corners at really t like high speeds, um, it's not just a flat piece of track that bends. Uh, what they do is they bank the track, right? So that you have a little bit of the force of gravity kind of pulling the car inwards. So that means that they can make tighter radius turns. So I kind of want to do that, but for light waves. Like not to go into too much detail here, but basically what you do is you want to make um, a gradient but instead of like the gradient being the height of the curve, the gradient is the refractive index. So like the inner part of the curve is gonna have a higher refractive index than the top part of the curve. So the light is almost like pulled towards the inner part because it's, just, it's attracted to the higher index. And then the other idea that I wanted to go with was called a uh, Bragg filter. Um, and you might recognize the name Bragg from the Hendrik Schoen series when I was talking about the uh, youngest Nobel laureate ever. That was uh, Bragg Jr. and Bragg Sr. They did a lot of work on X-ray crystallography, which is like, you know, you shine X-rays on a molecular crystal and then the, the size of the wavelength happens to match up like really well with the size of the atomic spacing. So that's how they like first mapped out what crystals looked like. And then from that you got an equation called Bragg's Law, and it just so happens that Bragg's Law can apply to a lot of like different systems in physics. So in the 1970s, uh, here in Ottawa, which is where I live and where I went to school, um, they, that's actually where they invented something called the Bragg filter, which is a, imagine like an optical fiber, so it's a, a glass tube, and normally you shoot light in one end and then it comes out the other. What they realized is that if you uh, take like ultraviolet light and you shine it over top of the um, like the fiber in like a like a very uh, kind of like a zebra pattern, so it's like stripes along it, um, the glass actually changes properties where it absorbed the UV light and it changes its refractive index. And then what happens is as the light's traveling through, a little bit of it is reflected at each of like the ultraviolet stripes and depending on the spacing of those stripes um, certain wavelengths can't pass through they're actually like perfectly reflected backwards so that's a really uh, clever way of making a wavelength selective filter so like 90 percent of the wavelengths pass through but like one very specific wavelength is reflected backwards and you can actually like make this sort of thing in glass tubes, you can make it in like chips of silicon. So that was the other half of my thesis. So around this time, uh, like end of fall 2020, um, this was when I was kind of thinking like, oh God, I need to graduate. So I was like planning out like, okay, I should have my first draft done this month. I should like be like all my results done, simulations, all my figures and graphs. Um, and then this is when I like first opened up like the big word document and like typed out the different chapter headings and like the titles and trying to like imagine what my thesis would look like. Uh, turns out I was way too optimistic. I was like at least one semester like way too ahead of schedule. 
or not ahead of schedule, but I was I was thinking I could graduate at least one semester before it was like physically possible. Like there's no way I could have gotten my thing written. So that was a, at least I got started thinking about it. Um, also, if you're in any sort of like STEM field, do not write your thesis in Microsoft Word. That is a terrible idea. Um, if you have the time, you should definitely learn LaTeX, which is kind of like half document thing like Microsoft Word, but it's also half programming language. So if you want like really specific like line spacing, you want really good math equations, you want figure numbers to be automated, you want your like citations to be automated, uh, LaTeX will save you literal like days of work. Check out overleaf.com if you want a very easily accessible way to learn LaTeX. Today's sponsor is not LaTeX. LaTeX is a free service. But uh, if Overleaf wants to sponsor me, I will happily shill their service. It's, it's, very, it's a very good service. Also, if the uh, special Indian edition of all my textbooks wants to sponsor me, I will happily uh, promote your work too. So, hey, I'm right. You already did. <laughs> so fuck, I did it for free. <laughs> Shit. Okay, so uh, winter 2021 was uh, bad news bears time. Because uh, if you remember from early on, I submitted a kind of like uh, sample circuit way back at like the Quebec City conference. And I, I wasn't really planning too much with that project at that point. It was just kind of like, okay, I have this opportunity. I'll like throw something on this circuit and like hopefully something will work. Um, like I was working with another like uh, research lab in Ottawa and they'd kind of given me that concept which I built upon and like sent it out and hopefully would come back with like something promising. Uh, it did not. Uh, we ended up waiting basically nearly a full year to get the chip back um, and then like we sent it into the other lab to get tested and then I had 30 devices on that chip. One of them kind of worked and it wasn't even that good. Like it was like talk about like a crushing wow is this what research is like moment like that was a very uh, existential like what am I doing with my life kind of thing so after that um, I was basically like fuck okay so I'm not gonna get like a functioning circuit back like that was my one shot it's during a pandemic it's gonna be even harder to like get anything made in this time frame I'm trying to graduate in like six months but basically what happened was my professor suggested that um, rather than doing like a, a joint fab run because we like split the cost between all those like other universities before, we could just do like a dedicated fab run which we could maybe get turned around in two months. Uh, plus we could like customize like all the individual thicknesses of the layers. We could do like choose the specific metals we wanted. I could choose like a bigger uh, design area. So. We're like, okay, th this, this is a plan. Um, but to like help justify the cost, she also suggested that I try and finish up my like other project idea and get both of them on the same chip. Cause that would be like, like I wasn't even expecting to get a functioning circuit for my other projects. So this was very much like a, okay, if this works, this is like, this would be very, very good. Uh, that led to probably the uh, two most stressful weeks of my entire degree where I had to take my uh, rough simulation work to a functioning prototype in two weeks and then also like make the layout design and submit it just so we can meet that like deadline. In the end, I got it working. Um, in retrospect, I'm kind of surprised I did because it was literally just like I was doing overnight simulations, like stuff that would run for like 48 hours at a time and then I'd check it and it wouldn't work. So the fact that I got that working in retrospect is kind of like I really did that. Look at me go. So at this point, um, it would take a little over two months for those chips to get back and then probably like a couple more weeks to get them tested and then I would actually have the results back. So the thinking was, okay, if I wanna graduate in August, so like I submit my thesis in August, I could like defend like a month later, then I could graduate. So it was like, okay, I can just start my thesis now. I need to like get writing and I can have it done for August. And then all you do is like, you like add on a paragraph with all your results and that's bim bam, thank you ma'am. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. And this actually lined up really well because my girlfriend was going away for like three months on a like tree planting 
job. So I was like, hey, I can just, you know, sit in my basement apartment as a cave gremlin and then just do my thesis for three months. And then I also, in like a, a two week period, grinded out the, um, like the first Bogdanoff video. So that uh, worked out really well. And then the thesis itself, uh, not fun, not a great time. Um, the most difficult parts are always the first and last 10% because all the middle stuff is like not that bad if you have like momentum going because like all I would say is like okay today I'm going to write like two paragraphs and like they don't have to be perfect and they don't have to be in order I just got to write two paragraphs and then eventually like three months go by and you've written uh, 151 pages uh, that, that's how long my thesis was, which is a little on the long side for like a master's thesis. On average, like the ones I was looking up in the, the database were like between like 80 pages to 120 pages. Um, PhD theses, sometimes those can go up to like 200. So mine was a little on the long side, but a lot of that was taken up by like the table of contents, uh, the references, like the, the front introduction section has like like 17 pages and then there's also a lot of like big tables and graphs that take up full pages on their own so it's, it's not literally 151 pages of like just pure writing but it is a lot of writing like and I had two fairly separate projects so I had to have like a theory section for one and a theory section for the other and then a result sections for one and a result section for the other so mine was a little beefier than I think like the average master's thesis for that specific reason. The title of the thesis was. In... Fuck! I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't. Know, I don't my... That's going in. You gotta put that. In. <laughs> I don't know my. I don't know my own thesis. That genuine like. What was it? Um, it was increased capacity in WDM and MDM networks via sub wavelength grading engineering. That that's a bunch of words to basically say like the the explanations that I gave earlier. So every semester has like a final cutoff date for when you can submit a thesis. Um, and in like, for the summer term, it's like early August. So uh, I submitted that and then you need to wait at least three weeks for a master's or six weeks for a PhD to actually have your defense because you need your committee to have time to actually like read through the thesis and uh, prepare questions. Um, I submitted mine like a fair bit early. So I had a lot of time to kind of like prep myself and um, I had to make like a 20 minute PowerPoint of like my entire thesis because you basically present a presentation and then the rest of your two hour defense is you getting just hammered with questions. Uh, the committee is made up of my supervisor, uh, one prof to basically administrate the thesis and then three profs who are actually going to be the ones doing the questions. And uh, you actually like, you're asked like if there's anyone who you like want to be on your thesis committee because you know their area of research is similar to yours or you think they might like be able to ask um, like interesting questions. I knew who was going to be on my committee before I actually did the defense but like you don't know what questions you're going to be asked basically. My thesis by the way was on Zoom because you know uh, the pandemic had kind of calmed down by that point in Canada, but it wasn't like, you still weren't allowed to go into campus. So um, I spent most of the morning panicking because my webcam wasn't working. And yeah, I was very nervous all day, but the actual defense was, it wasn't too bad. You start with one prof and they ratchet up their question difficulty and then they go to another one and they ratchet that difficulty up. And th there are definitely like some questions that stumped me, um, but for the most part, I think I did Okay. What, what happens at the end of like the two hours is it's just kind of like, okay, I guess, I guess we're done. Um, we're, we're going to put you in a different Zoom breakout room alone and the rest of us are going to go into a different breakout room and just discuss whether or not you passed. And so I'm sitting there for like, I'm sitting there for like basically 10 minutes in my little Zoom breakout room with my camera on just like. And, and they come back and then of course I passed because like for, for those who have not done like grad school, if you make it to a defense, uh, you've basically passed because like it, your prof is not going to let you get to that point 
unless they know that you have like done good work and they know that you're gonna pass. Like, like obviously I did like a whole video on the Boganoff brothers. The, the, the fact that they made it to a defense uh, was clearly like something was wrong there. The fact that they were able to like fail a defense, um, they should not have gotten anywhere near that stage of the process. Yeah, that, that's maybe a little comfort to you if you're doing a master's and you, you have like your, your defense scheduled. You basically made it. You basically graduated. You just need to actually like go through the motions. So yeah, that's uh, that's my degree. Um, since then, um, I've tried to submit a couple papers on my work. Um, I have one conference paper that got published. Conference papers are generally a little more uh, like chill than a full paper because it's more so just like here. Here's some like work that we're you know, we're not like fully done yet. Here's just like the basic idea. What you'll do is you'll take that work, flesh it out, make a full paper and then submit it to like, like an actual journal. Uh, I have one paper uh, being submitted to a journal. Um, still waiting to hear back on that one. And then there's like another kind of paper that I'm working on with another group that uh, may, might get submitted in the new year. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's it. Uh, if you have any questions about like my specific master's research and you want to know more detail, like feel free to leave a comment. I, I mean, you know, I'd love to talk about my work more. Big shout out to uh, my friend Charlie for helping me film this. I understood nothing that he said. <laughs>